Thank you, and, and thank you uh, to A Woman's Place and the LGB Alliance. And I've just seen somebody there who I was very rude to last time I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> but it was all in good fun. <laughs> Okay, so I have been in email correspondence with Jenny Formby, um, probably more than I have my own partner recently. <laughs> I actually left the Labour Party when all of this kicked off, and I'm just waiting for an invitation to rejoin, and that is the basis on which I would rejoin. But isn't it interesting that... It was the three women that signed the pledge. And Keir Starmer held out, didn't he? Yeah. Now, he was right to hold out. Yeah. And in many ways, I actually really respect and admire Keir Starmer. But he knows, as well as we do, that this is about misogyny and bullying. And it's always made much worse for women. Whenever our male comrades and supporters and allies speak out on our behalf with us, and I'm glad that they do, they get way less threats, misogyny and vitriol than do we. And as a journalist, you can also look at the way that men who write extremely good pieces, such as one that was written by Alex Massey recently, um, <coughs> in, on behalf of, of and in support of Suzanne Moore. Yeah. left alone and I'm glad that he was but we all know what happens to other feminist journalists when they speak up so what I want to say about and to the Labour Party is do they realise of course they do that they are actually colluding with the worst misogyny that I personally have ever seen in my life, in my adult life and since I became a feminist when I was 17 in 1979 I honestly have never seen anything on this scale. And yet it did get better. When I first wrote about this issue, about what I would say was the absolutely anti-science, regressive, anti-women, misogynistic diagnosis of transsexuality, as was then designed and put forward by 1950s psychiatrists. And this was in 2003. I wrote about it from a human rights perspective and I was inspired to write about it from a brave woman, Claudia, who was one of the, in fact, the very first in this country, transsexual, who spoke about regretting being railroaded in to having a sex change, as she will more accurately call it. And she was done so by opportunistic uh, uh, psychiatrists and surgeons and she was vilified and bullied by other transgender people. So after that, of course, even though I'd written about regret and about the human rights of transsexual people, I became a Nazi, a fascist, a hate monger, <laughs> someone who's caused trans people, including children, to take their own lives. I've been told that I've egged and spurred on violent neo-Nazi men who prowl the streets looking for victims to beat up and murder. And this isn't actually about my own personal experiences in a narcissistic way, like the children out there are narcissists. <laughs> this is just about grounding this in some proper feminism. Because I do think there's something rotten at the core of the Labour Party when it comes to women. And quite frankly, I think there always has been. And I think this is the reason why this party has gone as far as it has. It hasn't just come out of nowhere. It's attached to a kind of benign but growing and bubbling away sexism and misogyny that has never been properly dealt with. Think about someone like Owen Jones, if we have to. <laughs> so his argument is that the support for trans women are women, trans men are men mantra can't be based on sexism or misogyny because most women are supporters of trans rights, whereas fewer men are. He's done some poll on Twitter, I think. <laughs> but how often do we see women held up as some kind of a smokescreen to defend and invisibilise terrible things that men do to women? And an analogy here 
is prostitution, the sex trade. Women love it. Women choose it. It's women that want it. And you see how this really works hand in hand with men's rights. The rights of the beards. I know Owen Jones can't grow one, but... <laughs> this is doing to young lesbians who are coming out. We've already heard our speakers talk about this. But those young lesbians that are told that to be a radical feminist or a lesbian and to proudly label yourself as that, which took us a long time when I came out in the 70s, that that automatically makes you bigoted, narrow-minded, anti-sex, prudish, pearl-clutching, puritanical. Does this remind you of anything? <laughs> Has this ever been said about us before? <laughs> and particularly lesbians who reject sex with men. This is nothing different from the misogyny that I grew up with in the 1960s and 70s as a working class girl in the North East. In fact, it's far worse now in many ways. Because at least we knew that the women's movement was chipping away at this misogyny and calling men to account. And if I think about growing up with a Labour supporting, uh, with Labour supporting parents, a father who was a trade union official in the steel mill in the North East, who was sexist, as all of his male colleagues were sexist. Give me that any day, <laughs> any day over this faux progressive wank that we now have. men knew that what they were saying was out of order and they were challenged continually as my dad still is today. <laughs> Change is slow, we know this. But this is on another scale and it's insidious because it is dressed up as progressive, as something to do with left-wing politics, when we know it's just a men's rights movement. It's simply that. And when we had Fathers for Justice and Families Need Fathers and men's rights for taking kids off women they'd battered and raped or whatever their groups were called, the Liberals all knew that they were misogynistic and the Liberals were on our side. But the Liberals are our worst enemy in this now. Yeah. And they have meant that we sleepwalked into the worst scenario imaginable. And it's because they wouldn't speak out and they were either cowed or they were just cowardly or they really didn't understand that this was about as opposite to the fight for lesbian and gay rights in the 1970s, as you could imagine. I've lost count of the number of death threats, rape threats, all manner of vile fantasies from self-declared trans women that have appeared in my inbox or on social media. And like many others here, I've been told I should die in a grease fire and just hang on to what the crimes are that those of us that get this have committed by saying that we want to hang on to women's sex-based rights and no trans women are not female. That's literally it. I've had the worst kind of imagery sent to me, such as a pixelated face with six girl dicks being shoved down my throat at the same time to shut me the fuck up. And of course, the usual daily reminder that I'm too ugly to rape, but not too ugly for the rape fantasies, you understand. And no fewer than three of the current or previous advisors to Stonewall have threatened and defamed me and sent me some of that content that I've just told you about. One, and this is Googleable, people, because it's been screenshot to hell and back and it's on way back machine. One such advisor likened me, and I apologise about the grossness of this, likened me to the smegma on the end of a dildo used by trans women to dilate their neo-vaginas. And this person's aim was that when Bindle was Googled, this is what came up in the search. And that was quite a campaign. Another very, very um, high-profile trans person, trans woman, 
wrote a blog which was published online, Julie Bindle's Genitals. And these people are constantly lauded by Diva and Pink News and given awards. Of course, I and many of you and many of my colleagues here are told that those of us that they identify as second wave feminists, I just call us real feminists, <laughs> are... <laughs> We're old, we're bitter, we're ugly, we're irrelevant. Does this sound like misogyny to you? Yeah. My loved ones, even my pets, and they want to look out for my rescue cat Reggie, I tell you. <laughs> They've even been threatened. We'll come around and kill your pets. We'll set fire to your house. All kinds of horrendous things. But you know what the worst is? That what these people do that are fighting in the name of trans rights or human rights, those idiots out there, they stop me from doing my feminist work. They haven't lost me paid work. They haven't actually managed to drive me into a complete nervous breakdown. I'm usually on the edge anyway. <laughs> what they have done is they've followed me around the world and this has been endorsed, remember, by those dickheads that signed the pledge. They follow me to countries like Norway, even Cambodia they've appeared when I've been doing talks on the trafficking of children into the sex trade, onto child rape, where I've been talking about femicide and stalking by men, where I've been doing this as my feminist campaigning. They've shut down these talks, they've banged on the windows, we've had to have police escorts in countries outside of the UK. They just get on the internet and they just find their trans comrades and they just say, Bindle, transphobe, sex work, because they're all, of course, very keen on women being prostituted. Is this the kind of behaviour and politics that Labour want to support? As I said before, there is something rotten at the core of the Labour Party. There always has been, and I speak as someone that's never ever voted for any other party in my life. But this needs to be rooted out, and I don't give a fuck if they don't invite me back to the party. Thank you.